So our first speaker is a keynote is the keynote speaker. Um, there won't be a Q and A session, but he does have a session later to um, if you want to ask questions. Um, it's Alan Mustard who is the um, he's the chair of the OpenStreetMap Foundation, and he's been talking to a lot of people over the last year, um, virtually and in person. So he's got a lot of insight into OpenStreetMap, where it's come from, and what's changing. Um, so we're going to hear from Alan on winds of change. Um, I believe my technical team will. Since being elected first to the OSM Foundation Board of Directors and then chairman of the board last September, I spent a great deal of time on the telephone, Skype, and various conferencing apps listening to members of the OSM community, going all the way back to Steve Coast and forward through a mix of old timers, heavy mappers, software developers, working group members, local chapters and communities, and advisory board members. I also kicked off a SWOT analysis on the OSM Wiki, a survey of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, to hear from the broad OSM community what it thinks about the state of OSM. I'd like to share with you some conclusions I have drawn from these conversations and the SWOT analysis. I want to underscore that what you are about to hear is my own assessment based on 32 years of management experience, 20 of them in senior leadership roles. This assessment does not necessarily reflect either official OSM Foundation policy or the views of the board or any other of its members. The OSM Foundation is responsible for supporting but not controlling OpenStreetMap, raises funds, and generally creates an operating environment that allows mappers to map and data users to use the data. The board does not tell anybody what to map or how to map. The content of the OSM database is up to the mappers themselves and the local communities made up of those mappers. The data working group ensures that data conform to our copyright rules and helps the community enforce its other rules as to what the map database and its associated wiki should contain. The foundation's mission statement lists several responsibilities the board carries, and among them is this, the OSF, OSMF board and board members define a strategic vision. That vision has clearly been lacking for the last few years, in part because of dissension on previous boards, and in part because of dissension among members of both the foundation and the OSM community some of whom have historically objected to the notion that the board should make any decisions. The idea of the foundation board making decisions has been condemned as not the OSM way, and in some corners of the community, the view continues to be advanced that all decisions should be made collectively. This has led to paralysis, and thus many needed decisions were not made. In my conversations with community members since the start of the new year, only one person has insisted that the board should continue not making decisions. All others have expressed fatigue with the paralysis and suggested to me that it is time for the board to start making decisions that do not affect how anyone maps, but which will ensure the health and stability of our infrastructure and will protect the community's intellectual property. And make no mistake about that last point. Our intellectual property is valuable. It's now used by Apple, which combines it with data from TomTom Tom for Apple Maps. In 2010, or excuse me, 2019, Facebook switched 100% to OSM data, not because it is free, but because it is the highest quality global cartographic data set available. The user base is enormous and ranges from big corporations to a very long tail of small users. At one end, Microsoft's Bing uses OSM data, and so does ESRI. And then there's the humanitarian angle, exemplified by HOT, the humanitarian OSM team, which over the last 10 years has saved lives by creating maps needed by rescuers and medical personnel, all with OSM data. But that's only part of the picture. It's not just the big guys using OSM. It's thousands of map creators everywhere for whom OSM is crucial, and millions of users of the maps that they create, from small companies like Maps with Me to individual cartographers from Maribor to Manila, from Krakow to Cape Town. A map of the world that anyone can use has spawned an ecosystem of commercial and humanitarian organizations that don't merely use our data. They need it. They live by it. Between the SWOT analysis and the many conversations with stakeholders in the OSM community, I have identified a set of opposing viewpoints that, in their extreme forms, cannot be reconciled. This means that, ultimately, 
The community will have to make some decisions about which way to go in terms of a strategic vision or direction. This slide shows perhaps the most obvious of the opposing viewpoints I've heard or read, with traditional OSM views shown in red and advocacy for change shown in blue. Who is supposed to arbitrate between these two sets of opposing viewpoints? This arbitration is the board's responsibility, and as a board member, I have a fiduciary responsibility to our foundation and through it to its members to protect the OSM community's interests. That means that I, as a board member, must pull the community and through that process must discern what decisions the majority of the community supports. By law, I really do not have a choice. The board has to make decisions. But the decisions we as board members make must reflect what the community wants OSM to look like. There's a very simple reason for this. Without the community, there is no OSM, and a board that diverges from the community will endanger OSM's future. OSM is the community, and our map depends solely on the contributions of data from that community. I will not lead you through my analysis of the SWOT here, simply because I cannot do that in the time allotted. You'll have to visit the wiki and read the SWOT for yourself. If you want to read my analysis of the SWOT, send me an email, and I'll send it to you. However, I would like to lead you through some highlights drawn from both the SWOT analysis and my more than 40 conversations with representatives of various factions within the OSM community. The Cognoscenti widely recognize that demand for OSM services, including tiles, geocoding, and geodata, has outstripped the current configuration of hardware and software and is straining the volunteer labor force, particularly the sysadmins. According to the Operations Working Group, this demand is growing at an astounding rate, 50% year-on-year. Our current configuration of hardware, software, and human beings operating and maintaining the hardware and software is not sustainable. Something has to give. Either the system will implode at some point, or the OSMF will take action to ensure that the platform remains reliable. This is the rub. Those who are screaming that the OSMF board should not make decisions seem not to recognize that the world has changed and the demand for OSM data is straining the system to the breaking point. The Cognoscenti also widely recognize that the operations working group has collapsed, which they see as symptomatic of the increased demands placed on the hitherto 100% volunteer duocracy. Though not universally held, the view that OSMF should begin to hire staff to augment the volunteer labor, particularly sysadmins and a software developer to maintain the API, is wide widespread. Notably, individuals responsible for maintaining OSM infrastructure specifically expressed that sentiment. Interestingly enough, resistance to this notion appears to come from people not involved in operations or maintenance of infrastructure. Multiple old-timers made comments to the effect that, quote, nobody envisioned OSM's success, unquote. Or as one of them put it, OSM shouldn't have worked, but somehow it did, with lots of time, effort, emotion, and pride. One respondent commented that OSM provides maps to 2 billion users per day, yet has only two sysadmins to maintain the hardware. Several remarked that OSM has outgrown the model of duocracy that carried it this far, and opined that it needs a new management model. One respondent highlighted the disconnect between casual mapping and the size of the project as it is today, and noted that having grown from a smaller project and not especially geographically diverse, OSM today requires greater commitment. Another said, more structure and more governance is required just because it's used more extensively. Put another way, a respondent said, growth and success have led it past the type of individuals who started it. Countering that, one respondent commented, the catch-22 of OSM is that actual mappers want a smaller OSMF and don't want dependence on outside money. One respondent perhaps captured this dilemma best. Superorganization isn't necessary, but anarchy is not an answer either. The conversations revealed a desire for better communications between the board and the community's various tribes, including working groups, which can only be satiated by making the effort to reach out, to schedule calls, and then just a call. Local communities and chapters in particular would like better communication with the board. Geographic coverage of the current outreach effort remains a work in progress. That said, I must point out that the board has begun reaching out to local communities, and perhaps more important, has begun working harder to process local chapter applications more quickly than before. The board is also inviting a local chapter each month to brief us 
at the end of each board meeting. Surprisingly, a desire for vector tiles came up 12 times in conversations tying for second place with community outreach. Some respondents merely see in vector tiles a sign of progress, that OSM is keeping up with Google, but others see in them a solution to desires, such as multilingual standard maps. While the tech wizards asserted that OSMF hardware is adequate to host vector tiles, at least initially, surprisingly, not one respondent could quote a solid cost estimate for shifting from raster to vector tiles, nor could any respondent describe in brief a course of action needed to carry out such a shift. Time estimates range from a couple of weekends to six to eight weeks. One major issue appears to be who would control the style sheets that determine which vector maps are displayed, and some users in the commercial sphere expressed concerns that OSMF's sponsored vector tiles would compete with their paid services. In short, though there is a strong indication that vector tiles are desirable, there is a lack of consensus either as to how much would be too much and how much it would cost. One respondent noted that there is nothing to stop local chapters or others from hosting vector tiles if they wanted to and suggested urging local communities and chapters to experiment with vector tiles before the OSMF decides on a solution should it decide to do so. Respondents widely view the board as having failed to take responsibility for issues that have arisen. One respondent asserted that the board has taken exactly one significant decision since 2010, the change of license to ODBL. One consequence of this is that third parties unaccountable to the community at large have filled some vacuums. The board's conscious decision to take a hands-off approach to development of the ID editor in particular is a flashpoint in this regard. While some welcome development of a user-friendly intuitive editor, even if by a third party not under community influence, ID's tagging precepts have raised concerns about perceived lack of community input into development decisions. As one respondent put it, Key technology should be OSMF's responsibility. This is why the board has undertaken an effort to establish a software governance model for ID that will allow community input on controversial aspects of ID development to surface and to be taken into account without stifling the innovations that have made ID such a fantastic editor. And yes, I'm showing my bias here. I use ID. I use it a lot, and I absolutely love it. Another respondent viewed this abdication of responsibility as a prelude to long-term death of the OSM community, as it paves the way for a backdoor corporate takeover of OSM. Another respondent said bluntly that board weakness creates a power dynamic with outsiders who can pay workers and then control it. One respondent noted, there is room for the board to be more assertive because of the threats out there, the need to meet threats and challenges. Volunteers cannot do it themselves. Were the board to begin making substantive decisions in the opinion of some respondents, another weakness would quickly become apparent. As one put it, the board has no real ability to put contracts in place to implement decisions. The board, this person said, must either build capacity or let outsiders do it. Another issue is the board's failure to enforce its policies, such as tile use policy, which has led directly to a massive overload of OSM's tile servers which according to the operations working group at peak loads respond to nearly 400,000 tile calls per second. Respondents raised protection of the trademark a few times and thought that previous boards had neglected it. Additional issues include failure to pursue community development, a bias in favor of European points of view, and failure to demand attribution for use of OSM data. However, two prominent computer community members asserted that board inaction is quote, the OSM way, unquote, and indicated a desire to see the OSMF board as a figurehead, existing solely to fulfill requirements of the Companies Act 2006 and nothing more. As one put it, the board is to do the minimum necessary to keep OSM running. Another expressed fear that a future board could, quote, go in a bad direction, unquote, and thus the precedent of the board's making decisions could bode ill. The community will need to reconcile this divergence in attitudes one way or the other. Shifting to the diversity question, communities outside Western Europe generally welcomed the board's recent adoption of a diversity statement and formation of the Diversity and Inclusion Special Committee. One community went so far as to say it was long overdue, but still is not enough because local communities avoid speaking up out of fear of very vocal and hostile community members in other geographic areas shouting them down. One respondent said bluntly that the Diversity and Inclusion Special Committee, quote, needs a space for discussions without being attacked, unquote, 
incited a tendency to intimidate on the part of other community members. In that regard, multiple respondents called for a code of conduct of some sort to moderate dialogues and reduce the fear of hostile responses. Respondents in Africa and Asia underscored the cost of volunteering, noting that in lower income countries, the cost of internet access and the need to work more than one job to support a family constrains time devoted to volunteer mapping. This is an obstacle to geographic diversity. Respondents see the fee waiver program for foundation membership positively in theory, but in many minds its impact remains to be seen. Data users were surprisingly supportive of diversity because they see it as a source of data quality. As one respondent put it, quote, mapping is somewhat subjective, unquote. So diverse mappers generate more diverse, that is, more complete, data than does a white male dominated mapping community. Many respondents complained of special interests steering or dominating issues to the detriment of the broader interests of the OSM community. As one of them put it, if you let the loudmouths direct strategy, nothing will happen. Another put it slightly differently, use of the project is imperiled by a few loud voices. On the other hand, one respondent in Europe criticized the board for focusing on political correctness by publishing the diversity policy and forming the special committee. The sixth most raised issue revolved around artificial intelligence and machine learning, with those in favor of incorporating them under human approval processes represented in Asia, Africa, and among the corporate members sponsoring those technologies. Opposition to artificial intelligence and machine learning seems to be concentrated in Western Europe, where it is viewed as of little utility. Support is found in geographic locales facing daunting obstacles, high internet costs, low internet penetration, and low volunteerism, the latter two often rooted in economic circumstances. As one respondent put it bluntly, our country is vast and we don't have enough volunteers to map all the roads and waterways by hand. Mappers in such circumstances appear to welcome AI tools as a way of increasing craft mapper productivity. Interestingly, the corporate members underscored the critical importance of local knowledge, for as one put it, AI can draw a road but only a local mapper can name it. And you and I might add, certify that it's a road and not something else. Another non-corporate respondent noted, a growing proportion of data cannot be collected by armchair mapping. We need on-the-ground knowledge. Corporate users who professed keen interest in improved data quality highlighted the role of AI in rapidly detecting vandalism so that the data working group and local mappers can react quickly. While application of AI and machine learning is not a board issue, strictly speaking, but rather one squarely in the laps of the local communities, each to decide within the framework of organized mapping guidelines, its importance to certain local communities was striking. As I start to wrap up this presentation, I want to share some quotes that seem to strike a middle ground between the two extremes I showed you earlier. The last quote hit me right between the eyes. In researching the work of past boards and the low level of decision making for the past decade, it became apparent that in many cases the board shied away from making decisions that were expected to attract vocal criticism, even if the number of critical voices itself was small. Just like there's no healthy democracy without a free press, critical voices have their place in a healthy community. While some might suspect such voices to simply seek to impose their own views, they can also have their fingers on the pulse of the community. But the expectation of criticism, even fierce criticism, should not lead to a failure to make decisions on the part of the board, as long as those decisions reflect the interests of the community as a whole and, what's critically important, of the OSM project more generally. Anarchy is not healthy for any organization, and it is my firm opinion that the elected board of directors of the OSM Foundation must make decisions that will ensure the continued health and stability, indeed, the very future of the OSM movement, all the while not telling anybody what to map or how to map. These are the core values of OSM as posted on the OSM Foundation's wiki. I invite you to read them now, and I have a request. Translate them into your native language if it isn't English, and post them on the OSM wiki. If we bear them firmly in mind, we can more easily come to agreement on the decisions the community and the board are going to have to make over the next year, the next two years, the next decade. We want to make the best map data set of the world. We want the data to be available under a free and open license to everybody. We want it to be powered by its community. 
We want the data to be used as widely as possible. We favor objective ground truth over all other sources. And we want for you to map the things that you care about. And we want to be able to ensure that you have the freedom to do so. Based on the core values, these are examples of the types of questions the board needs to ask the community, in my opinion. If we're going to live up to our core values, the board needs answers. In most cases, however, the board will leave the answers to the local chapters and communities. To the degree possible, I agree that OSM should govern itself and that local communities and the volunteer working group should decide what works best for them and for the project. But when it comes to existential issues, such as maintenance of infrastructure, such as expanding OSM into spaces where it is not, such as protecting our intellectual property, the board must act if it is to live up to its responsibilities. Demand for OSM data is growing 50% year on year. We need more money to ensure stability of our platform. Where will the money come from? What risks do we face and how do we guard OSM against them? Do we need to invest in a project to render vector tiles, for example? Should we even do that? Or should we leave it to someone else, to a local chapter or to a third party? If we should do that, should we limit access so we don't compete with commercial providers in the ecosystem? The community is divided on these questions, so the duly elected board has to decide based on a combination of community input and the board's own assessment of what is in OSM's best interests, not merely for survival, but in order to thrive into the next decade. I encourage you to make your voice heard. Join the OSM Foundation. You can do it online. Once a member, then join the OSM Talk mailing list and start sharing your expertise and ideas for making OSM better and better for everyone. I thank you for your attention. Okay, so um, that was the keynote from Alan Mustard. Um, and I see you've been putting stuff in the, um, the Q&A there. Um, so Alan, uh, as keynote, isn't there isn't a Q&A session, but he does have a self-organized session um, that's at 7 p.m., 1900 hours. So you can go to the website, look at the self-organized sessions there and join him, he's doing a Q&A um, as chair of the board, which that talk kind of pushed some big questions on there. Um, you'll get to see him face to face and that will be a live kind of chat. Um, we'll make sure he can see those questions um, so that he can maybe answer some of them there. But I think he's opening up to any questions um, that you might have. Um, also on that talk, it talked a lot about the history about OpenStreetMap and the project. Um, you might be interested that at uh, 5.15 this evening, so 17.15, Frederick Rams talking about um, misunderstandings uh, in the history of OSM that I think might bring some context to some of the things um, or add on to some of the things that Frederick talked about in that talk. Um, now, this is track one of State of the Map 2020. Um, track two is about to start. I think they're just trying to work out some technical difficulties, um, but there's about two minutes there until that starts. Um, and yep, you've got your questions there. So, and as I said, we're talking on social media. Um, there's Twitter, the hashtag Sotom um, 2020. There's the Telegram group. We're using the old one, um, SOTM 2018, because lots of people are there. Um, and there's IRC as well. So if you uh, want to come up on the microphone, ask orally, or if you want to type it, if you prefer to type it, go ahead and type it. But uh, uh, we're open for questions. I was hoping we could have kind of an oral Q&A here. So uh, um, 
you should be able to come up on your microphones. I'm looking, Alan, through those um, questions that were asked when your keynote uh, session was going on. I know that wasn't the intention of um, this Q&A, but I do like on there, there's question number three, which is, uh, I'm not sure who asked it, but how are you ensuring the loud voices don't derail progress? Well, I think this is one of the critical things has been the outreach to the community uh, that we don't only uh, look at the responses or to reactions or to uh, suggestions by people who volunteer information. I think it's been important that uh, this board has been reaching out to people who have uh, hitherto been silent, quite frankly, and have hesitated to make their voices heard. So we're reaching out. Uh, we're reaching out geographically. We're reaching out to different strata of the community, uh, different corners of the community, uh, and hearing what more people have to say. So I think, I think that's tactically how how we're approaching it now. In terms of getting a sense of what the majority of the community thinks about an issue, that's more difficult, and we don't have the resources, we don't have the time, and I don't think the community has the attention to want to vote on every issue. So uh, there's going to be a certain amount of the boards simply going out, talking to different corners of the community and then doing its very best to try to figure out, A, what's what's best for the community, what's best for the project, and B, uh, what do people think is the best, best path forward, and whatever the issue is. I'll go back and look at the pad here for a minute. Uh, do we have a breakdown of OSMF members by country or continent? No, we do not, because uh, I don't think we have those statistics. Uh, we can go back and we can ask. I can go back and ask, but I don't think we've ever done a breakdown. I've never seen a breakdown like that. Um, okay, someone has a question here. I'd like to challenge the idea that decentralization and vision are opposites or incompatible. Um, yeah. Uh, I have no argument with that. Um, they're not necessarily incompatible, but we haven't had much of a vision up till now. Uh, what led you to conclude that craft mappers are universally opposed to change while the commercial stakeholders universally want change? Um, I don't think I came to that conclusion. Um, you know, when you're talking to large numbers of the of the community and 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 trying to reach out across the community, you draw some generalizations. And so I've never said that all members of one particular faction believe a certain thing. Uh, it's more along the lines of generalities and uh, where we see things going. Um, Loud voices, did you talk to any non-loud voices in your talks? How did you choose between who to talk to and who not? Um, I talked to all kinds of non-loud voices in my in my conversations. And in terms of how did I choose them, uh, it's, a, it's a something called uh, snowball sampling. You start out talking to people you know about, and then you ask them, who else should I be talking to? And they give you the names and sometimes emails and phone numbers of other people to talk to, and it snowballs. Uh, it gets bigger and bigger. And then, of course, in geographic reach, I reached out to the people I could find contact information for and who would respond to me. I mean, there were people I reached out to who never got back to me, and I would still like to talk to them. But uh, it basically was a combination of recommendations from people you should talk to this person or my identifying people I wanted to talk to or groups that I wanted to talk to and reaching out to them. And then they responded and were happy to give me an hour of their time, which quite frankly is a gift. You know, someone talking to you for an hour, that's, that's a gift. Um, You point out that the weight of someone's opinion voice should not be defined by its loudness. What do you think should be the criteria instead to decide what weight is given to opinions voiced by those in a position of making decisions? You know, this is uh, this is an issue that is 
you be, you you face this decision no matter where you are, whether you're in uh, an NGO like the OpenStreetMap Foundation, or whether you're in a in a private company, or or whether you're in the government. Quite frankly, you know, to, to to whom do you listen? And a lot of times, you listen to the people who make the most sense. You listen to the people who are clearly informed and the people who clearly have a sense of the reality of the situation, how situations are changing, how circumstances are changing. Uh, if there's one constant in the world, it's change. And we need to adapt to those changes. So uh, I, I think a lot of it comes down to having common sense uh, on the part of the members of the board of, of directors of the foundation. And we will listen to everybody, but one of the axioms of leadership is listen to everybody, but listen most closely to your best people. So I think that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to hear what everybody has to say because everybody has a perspective. <laughs> okay. Didn't intend to evoke laughter, but I guess I did. Um, let's see. You've got a question in the um, chat as well from Dan. All right. Richardson. All right. Let me take a look at the question in the chat here. Um, Does OSM keep very good backups so our recent edits don't disappear one day? Yeah, we have pretty good backups of the of the data, and there are multiple copies of the planet file too. Um, is there a link to your talk and slides earlier? I think there will be. I don't have it up yet, but I think I think the state of the map committee is going to do that. Um, Dorothea just posted that for you, so that's up there. See, did I miss any in the in the chat? No, that's that's it on the chat. I'll go back here to the pad then. When you say the community, do you include corporate voices in that? Uh, this is a very interesting question, simply because so many people in the community have tried to tell me who is in the community and who is not. Uh, my view, and this is my personal view. My view is that the community consists of anybody who believes he or she is in a, in the community. So if you have people who say, I am part of the OSM community because I contribute mapping, I contribute software development, I contribute money, uh, I'm a member of the foundation, uh, for whatever reason, I I think that anybody who thinks they are part of the community is part of the community and particularly it's important if they are a contributing member of the community so yeah i i would say yes i would include the corporate voices in that because the corporate voices are contributing they are contributing software development they are contributing mapping data they are contributing money uh, so yes they are part of the community are they uh do they have a a larger voice in the community than anyone else i would say probably not they have a voice, they have a point of view. Is their point of view the one that is going to prevail? Uh, I would say probably not uh, because the community is quite large, it's quite expansive. Um, let's see, the full SWOT analysis. Yeah, pretty much. I think uh, I'll have to go back and look at my diary and and see how extensive that is. I think I have a little more extensive. Uh, I have a more. I do. I have a PowerPoint presentation uh, on the SWOT analysis. It's a little bit more extensive than that, and I can send you that if if you're interested. I didn't want to inundate people with that, um, but if you're interested in and in looking at my take on the SWOT analysis, just email me. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll send you a copy of that PowerPoint slide set. A uh, very long question here, number nine, uh, regarding the role of businesses in OSM, Global Logic. Um, I oppose corporate involvement in OSM and OSMF, not just under the Global Logic model, but also, let's see. 
Where's the question? Where's the qu okay? Here's the question. What measures can we have in place? What is being done? What can I do to ensure the OSM project continues being open and volunteer driven while allowing for a healthy relationship with powerful corporations? Well, I think there are two things, two points I want to make. First of all, I think uh, one of the most important things we can do is empower the local chapters and the communities. Uh, this is one of the reasons that this board is working as hard as it is to get more local chapters uh, in under the OSM umbrella to support local communities. This is one of the reasons we've changed the membership criterion from contributing 15 British pounds to being able to do 42 days of mapping per year. And that qualifies you for foundation membership. So this will, these sorts of things are broadening the base of the community geographically, as well as uh, in terms of socioeconomic status. And this is important because the broader the base of the community, the harder it will be for someone to uh, come in and try to take over the project. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, I think it's important for us to understand what the motivation of, of companies and corporations is. Corporations and companies are about making money. Uh, they want to turn a profit. Uh, at least the ones in 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 the private sector that are that are about commercial activity. I'm not talking about NGOs. Uh, the corporations we're dealing with right now pretty much understand our model. They understand that we are a community driven organization. They understand that we are volunteer driven. So they're not about to touch the wellspring of the data that they find so valuable. And I think this is the interesting part of being part of the OSM community right now is that the data, which are allegedly, according to Accenture, are worth over a billion and a half dollars, or at least they would cost, let me amend that, they're not worth a billion and a half dollars, I suspect they're worth more than that, but it would cost over a billion and a half dollars to reproduce them if you went out and paid people to do it. Um, these companies are not interested in messing with that model. They're interested in getting their hands on the data and using the data and making sure that the data are available. So I don't perceive a threat from those corporations that are right now using our data and are part of our ecosystem. What I do see is a potential threat from somebody outside that group trying to come in and take over. So that's that's the the threat that I perceive. You may you may uh, perceive other threats, but but that's what I'm guarding against, and that's what I'm trying to 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 create some some barriers to or some some sort of insurance policy that makes sure that that won't happen. Um, you mentioned white male dominance in your talk. Does this race and sex gender, in your opinion, constitute the most severe or most significant dimensions in the lack of diversity in the OSM community? I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if it is the most severe or the most significant dimension. I would argue that uh, geographic diversity is probably just as significant and this is one of the reasons, again, that the board is pushing very hard to get more local chapters to to uh, develop better connections to the local communities, uh, because we need we need more on the ground data collection. We need more people in the community for a variety of reasons, both be, to, to improve the database and to also to inoculate uh, the organization against a hostile takeover from outside. So uh, that's a hard question to answer. I, I, I don't think that I can answer that uh, truthfully, uh, but it is an issue and that's why I raised it in the talk. You were speaking of uh, opposition to machine learning and artificial intelligence in Western Europe. Could you elaborate on what this refers to? This refers back to my conversations. Uh, I talked to people in Western Europe. I talked to people in Asia, I, uh, especially East Asia and South Asia. Uh, I talked to people in Africa, I talked to people in Latin America. In those geographic locations, I did not hear opposition to uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence. And in fact, 
in some of those places, machine learning and artificial intelligence are viewed as necessary tools for them to do what they think they need to do. Uh, and since we put a high premium on local mappers and the idea that local mappers should drive the project, um, I listened to that, I heard that, and I carried that message back to uh, the community at large through through my, my diary entry and then in this, this presentation. Um, opposition to machine learning and artificial intelligence came exclusively from Western European uh, interlocutors. I didn't hear it from any other geographic location, and that's just what I'm telling you. Um, question number 12, vector tiles. Have you asked current developers of community map styles on input in the future of community map design? Um, it hasn't really gotten that far. I've asked people uh, when they've raised vector tiles, well, how do we do this? Uh, I'm not a software developer. I'm a mapper. So I know how to map uh, and, and I can generate some very primitive uh, raster maps using uh, freeware but uh, I'm not someone who actually even knows really what questions to ask. So we haven't gotten that far in, the, in, in terms of the discussion of vector maps. And in terms of whether the OSM Foundation would pay people to work on development of, of vector maps, um, that's a possibility. Uh, that, that that we would pay somebody to do that, but I don't think I don't think the, the the foundation board is at a point yet where we're willing to 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 consider that seriously because we don't have a plan, we don't have uh, we don't really have a, a decision uh, yet that that we want to go forward with vector maps. And again, that's something where we really need to hear from the community. Does the community uh, want us to do vector maps? And if so, what kind of vector maps and what should they look like and how extensive should they be? And should we compete with the commercial ecosystem that is producing and selling vector maps? Uh, I, I really think, I think there are a lot of questions that need to be answered before we go down that path. Uh, question 13, lucky 13, what are your thoughts on user group instead of chapter in some countries running a government approved legal entity like a chapter is very difficult. Yeah, we've talked about that, Naveen, uh, and, and you and I talked about this, of course. That is something that, that uh, we're going to look to the local communities to tell us how they want to associate with the foundation. Uh, there is no one size fit all, and and India is not the only country where this is an issue. This is this is an issue in other parts of the world as well. So, we really need to hear from the local chapters, if or the local communities, I should say, if local chapter status is not something that works for you, tell us what does. Tell us what would work, and we'll try to figure out some way of, of making it work out for both of us. Uh, question 14, uh, what is the common goal of the OSM? Well, I think if you go back to look at the uh, OSM Foundation website, there's a line in there that says uh, we want to create a map of the world that anybody can use. Uh, and as Frederick Rahm pointed out, we aren't really building a map. We're building a database from which you can project a map, you can render a map, which which is true. Uh, he's absolutely right about that, but of course, if you try to say that our objective is to create a database from which anybody in the world can render a map, you're going to lose your audience and they, they aren't going to really understand what you're talking about. So we tend to oversimplify that statement, but that's that's the common goal. The common goal is is to create a map, which is really a database from which you can create your own map that anyone can use free of charge. Uh, so I agree with Fred uh, on, on that score. Um, unfortunately, you, you can't take that and put it into one compact sentence so that sounds good. Uh, question 15, with each image we set several meters different from each other, the more we add, the more damage we do to the map. Yes, this drives me crazy too. So yes, please get some good data imagery. Well, you know, uh, the, the imagery is pretty much all donated, and um, this is something it has to do with the uh, ortho rectification of the imagery. 
which is not 100% accurate. That's why in ID, you can slide the map around to, to fit. And that's why I'm very glad that in my mapping of Turkmenistan, I collected an awful lot of GPS, excuse me, GPS traces. So I have GPS traces I can use to go back to truth back to in order to make sure that, that the imagery is lined up with, with the map. Uh, I don't know that there's an easy solution to it because orthorectification is uh, kind of loosey goosey at times. Uh, questions asked during the Q and A. Uh, let's see. What are the threats to OSM in the future? Presidential order shutting it down, evil empires, troops secretly deleting edits, anything, legal action from Google for who knows what, better back it up in several different jurisdictions. Yeah, in terms of backup, that is something that we're looking at as to where we need to have backups. Uh, we're looking generally at what we need in the way of infrastructure. And in terms of whether we need to start hiring uh, people like sysadmins, to augment our volunteer sysadmins. Uh, we're, we're concerned about the infrastructure. We're looking at this a little bit more broadly. In terms of the, uh, the threats to OSM, I don't, I, don't see, I don't see threats from Google or from uh, any of the evil empires out there trying to shut us down. Um, Again, uh, the major threat I would see is a potential hostile takeover from somewhere in the corporate world, from somebody who is not currently part of our ecosystem and doesn't understand that a hostile takeover would kill the project. So uh, I think, I just don't see, I don't see a high probability threat. All the threats I see are relatively low probability, but potentially high impact. And that's why we need to guard against them. We, we're, we're basically talking about low probabilities, but high impact events. And that's, again, this is, this is what's behind my efforts and the board's efforts to expand the user base, to, to get more people into the OSM Foundation, um, to get a, a broader base of local communities and chapters. Do you think the OSM intellectual property is not currently protected enough from your comments in the talk earlier? I think from a legal standpoint, it's protected well enough. I think uh, we have the legal protections we need, but I think we need to be more aggressive about defending them. And in this regard, I'm very happy with what one of our local chapters is doing in defending our intellectual property uh, in, uh, in one of the countries of Europe. Um, we have, again, this is something where the local chapters can be very helpful as well. That if you see a violation of our license under the ODBL, um, take action. And uh, this particular local chapter came to us uh, last year, asked uh, for a power of attorney to uh, pursue a, a legal action in order to cause someone violating our license to come into compliance and is pursuing that. So uh, this is a good thing. And I think, I think we've been a little lax in the past about this. I think, I think it's good that we're protecting our intellectual property. So that's that list. Let's go back to big blue buttons here. There's some new ones here. Um, let's see here. Uh, should the board ensure that all continents are represented then? Uh, Janet, what do you mean in represented where? I, uh, oh, in the board? You know, I don't, I, I worked in the U.S. government where we had de facto quotas for years. Um, uh, officially, there were no quotas, but unofficially, yeah, we had quotas uh, for hiring and things like that, and it just never worked. I'm not a big fan of saying, oh, we're going to have one person from North America, one person from Europe, one person from Asia, whatnot. What I would rather see is I would rather see a more organic growth of, of the geographic diversity on the board. Uh, I would like to see more people actively involved in the working groups, more people actively involved in uh, 
some of the special committees that we're setting up and then see them run for the board. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think we should have quotas and say every continent will will be represented on the board. I just don't think that's necessary and it's not going to lead to a good resort result. Um, Okay, Guy has asked, what about sovereign or national threats to OSM? Are these a possibility in your opinion? I suppose it's possible. Um, I suppose it's possible that a, uh, a country could sue us because uh, it doesn't like something in the data. Uh, again, I think it's a low probability. Uh, but I think it's something, I think it would be very hard for a sovereign country to, to pursue us on something like that, particularly since uh, the map is in a state of flux and you know, it would probably be easier for a sovereign country to unleash some mappers to go in and say, we're going to change the map, um, draw a different line of control or a different boundary or something like that and then tag it appropriately so that that as long as it doesn't run afoul of 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 our general principles and how things should be tagged i i haven't gotten a whiff of that other questions go back to the pad Okay, there's a question in French, which I'm going to have to run through. I'm going to have to run it through DeepL or something. Just a minute. Okay. Where did it go? I don't see where the question went. I clicked on translate and it disappeared. I guess this is at the topic of what you do from time to time, as in should the homepage show something other than the map links to local communities? What thoughts do you have on this? Is the microcosm's work in progress the start of something bigger? Um, I don't. I don't really have a view on that. Um, you know, I thought what what Frederick said about uh, what 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 they, they've done in in uh, Boscus uh, was pretty interesting. Um, I really did, I, I don't have a position on that. Uh, I, I, I think that that it would be good to have links to the local communities. I like that that's available through the uh, the the ID editor, for example. That's really good that that information is there. But in terms of whether we should do a revamp of the OSM website so that it shows that information before it shows the map, um, I'll leave that to web designers and to, to, to people who understand that a lot better than I do to, to, to come up with those suggestions. Uh, I'm probably the wrong person to, to, to ask that question of. Well, here's an interesting comment. Gee, you talk like a CA, CEO, and I like that, but CEOs need big salaries. As I understand it, you are just a volunteer. So might I say OSM is your hobby? Uh, well, uh, I got involved. Uh, if, you've, if you've seen the video that I did uh, at State of the Map 2016, you know why I got involved in OSM in the first place. And if you've seen my uh, banquet speech to the North American Cartographic Information Society, from uh, last fall, 
you can see where it led to, uh, that it, it became a little bit more than a hobby. It uh, actually uh, became part of my work plan while I was ambassador to Turkmenistan. Um, CEOs need big salaries. Well, that would be nice, but I'm retired now. I'm living on my pension, uh, which is enough to live off of. So, um, yeah, I'm still a volunteer mapper. I still work on the map of Turkmenistan. I still work on the map of Falls Church, Virginia. Uh, if you go in and look at my edits, you can see what I've been up to. So as always said, my hobby. Yeah, I guess at this point it is my hobby. Um, um, and given that uh, I'm under social isolation due to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it's a pretty nice hobby. Let's me uh, go to other places around the world and in the internet. So if you want to offer me a big salary for no work, that would be wonderful, but uh, I don't think anybody's likely to do that. Other questions? Oh, Yost uh, just pointed out, we pay Alan with TLC and the privilege to buy us beers. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they're all going to collect on their beers one of these days. Anybody, buddy, anybody want to come up on the microphone and ask a question? Open mic. No, no open mic. Guy says, I think we need to have a debate about the use of AI in the future of OSM and discuss the benefits to the project. Uh, you know, my, my stance on this has been that this is up to the local communities. Um, it's up to the local mappers. Uh, this isn't something that I think the foundation really uh, can touch simply because we don't tell anybody how to map and we don't tell anybody what to map. So as as the as a board chair of the foundation, I'm not in a position to say, yes, we should do AI, no, we should not do AI, or we should restrict it or regulate it somehow. Um, this is really something that's up to the local communities to decide and then local mappers. So if you want to have a debate on this, I would say go ahead and have that debate. But the debate should be should involve the entire community and should be is quite geographically diverse. And Guy says, I think it would be beneficial to assist with the tedious jobs such as plotting, building outlines, which take much time but offer advantages, perhaps. Well, there's that, but, but you know, when I talked to one of the uh, local communities, Guy. Uh, their comment was that it's very helpful in drawing roads and drawing waterways in areas that have lots of roads and lots of waterways. And um, my concern on that is that I can remember driving uh, once in, in out in the boondocks of one of the countries that I was assigned to. And we thought there was going to be a road that would go off to the right that would take us where we wanted to go. And we got there and there was no road there. It was a it was a creek. And we couldn't drive in the creek, obviously. Uh, but somebody had done, an armchair mapper had added this road where there was no road, where it was a creek instead. And I found this in Turkmenistan too, when I was in Turkmenistan, that there were armchair mappers who had drawn things that simply didn't exist. and I had to correct them. So I think, I think there's a place for AI. I think there's a place for machine learning. But I think that that place needs to be coordinated on the ground local knowledge because only a local mapper can tell you if what you are looking at is, is really what you think you're looking at. And, uh, and, and one interesting thing I wanna to share too was, was in my conversations with the advocates for AI, uh, their insistence that it must be combined with local knowledge because the on the ground knowledge is, is key one person put it this way we can we can build the christmas tree but someone else has to decorate it for us you know we can draw the outlines but somebody has to tell us what they actually represent what's inside so 
So yeah, I think a debate would be would be healthy. It would be useful, uh, but I think it has to incorporate uh, geographic diversity as well as a lot of of a lot of discussion of what the benefits versus versus the the, the dangers are. Okay, I've got a little thing here saying there are more questions. I'll jump in if you'll offer an open mic if that's uh, still available. Sure, go ahead. Uh, so Rob here from are. the UK, can you hear me okay? Yeah. So you used a phrase a couple of moments ago in answering that previous question. Um, I think the phrase was debate with the entire community. I find it very hard to judge the opinion of the community and even to follow all the different communication channels and that's just the ones you know in in one language that alone throwing in a, a diverse set of languages into the mix so uh, mm -hmm. i just wondered if you wanted to expand on that a little bit as to you know if, you, if we are having these really difficult conversations about things like ai how do we ensure that we are getting a, few, a full debate across the entire community and that we're uh, working together to try and find consensus rather than just opposing opinions in different places and, and not actually sharing that across different channels or forums. Yeah, well, this is one of the big challenges of, of OSM and, and the community is the fact that we are not only dealing with different languages, we're dealing with a lot of different communications channels. Uh, Maggie Cawley had did a great PowerPoint presentation at State of the Map Africa a few years ago showing how many different communication channels there are. Uh, I highly recommend her PowerPoint presentation on that to just give you an idea of the complexity uh, of, of that task. So, for example, if you want to talk to OSM Japan, you don't talk to OSM Japan in the mailing lists. You talk to OSM Japan on Facebook and in Slack. Uh, that's that's what they use pretty much exclusively, and they communicate 100% in Japanese. They don't communicate in, a, in any other language. So uh, that's just one example. There are other examples as well. So I think it's going to take a lot of effort, and anybody who wants to undertake a community conversation on AI and on on machine learning needs to bear in mind, you're going to have to do some outreach. You can't just send out a, a broadcast message over one of the talk lists and say, we're having this discussion, we're having this debate, please join us, uh, join in with us and, and, and let's talk about it. You're going to have to identify the communities, what channels they use. You're going to have to translate your message into their language and send it out to them. And then you may have to pick up the phone and call them and ask them, did you receive my message? Are you thinking about it? How soon can we expect a response from you? And this was one of the interesting things when I started my outreach in January of this year, calling different communities, calling different uh, individuals. Um, the reactions that I got were quite interesting in some cases of people saying, well, this is the first time we've ever gotten a phone call from a member of the board asking us our opinion. This is the first time anybody's contacted us which tells me just how badly fragmented the community is. So uh, it's not a trivial task. It will not be a trivial undertaking. And you're absolutely right. Uh, it's something that needs to be done. We need to have a conversation about AI and machine learning. And in terms of, of where it comes out, I think it, where it's going to come out probably based on what, what each local community wants. Uh, you know, if, if Western Europe doesn't want AI in Western Europe, then AI will stay out of Western Europe because the local mappers won't accept it. But if local mappers in parts of Asia want to use AI and machine learning, then I suspect it'll happen, it'll be used, and, and, and there may be parts of Asia where it's not used. Um, I, really, I, I really see this as, as something that, that is the domain of the local mappers. Other questions? And thanks for coming up on open mic. Anyone else for open mic? Let's see, someone wrote Turkmenistan boy, I bet they clamped down on their national data bed. Yeah, it's hard to get good data. Uh, out of out of Turkmenistan, um, 
what do you do when you can't zoom in past zoom level X and can't convince the Cardo people that people think their mouse must be broken? Um, well, you just go to another geographic location and map there, I guess. Christoph, did you mean that as a joke? Might be a good idea to reread the whole question on PAD, RE, Western Europeans, and AI mapping. Which one was that, Christoph? Which 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 question number? Yeah, let me see if I can find it, Christoph. Oh, uh, let's see. Okay, here's the, here's the question. Okay, question 11. You were speaking of opposition to machine learning and artificial intelligence in Western Europe. Can you elaborate on what this refers to? Is it possible that you have misunderstood opposition to a certain practice of using technology to generate data with questionable collection to the observable reality and no or limited control of the mappers over the technology as principal opposition to a technology in general here? No, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think I've misunderstood it, uh, Christoph. And I think I think the key here is, again, that it has to be a decision of the local mappers. And if the local mappers are in control of the use of the technology and are able to exert quality control over it so that a, a ditch that is in reality a ditch, but which AI misinterprets as a road does not get drawn as a road, that you have someone on the ground uh, in the local mapping community who looks at it and says, no, that's a, not a road, that's a ditch, we're rejecting that. So really, uh, I don't think there's disagreement here on philosophical grounds. I think it's more along the lines of who's, who's in control of the map and the local mappers are in control of the map. Um, the debate regarding paid mappers is an interesting one that came up last year at State of the Map with the idea that in developing countries, this could be useful. We'd need to be able to finance it too and have mappers. Would that be would that be advocates to assist perhaps? Um, I can only give you my personal point of view on paid mapping. I can't really speak for the board or for the community or for anybody else. Uh, my view is, is that the foundation should not pay for mapping. Uh, there have been people that I've conversed with in my conversations who have advocated for that, who have said that we need to do paid mapping in certain parts of the world and that the foundation should pay for it. I disagree with that. Um, it is on one of my slides because it was part of the information I collected. But my personal view is that if we're going to maintain a policy that the foundation does not tell anybody what to map or how to map, then the foundation cannot pay for mapping because as soon as we start paying for mapping, we start telling people what to map and how to map. And, and that is a red line to me. So uh, if other people want to pay for mapping, whether it be NGOs, uh, whether it be private corporations, uh, that's up to them and the local communities. They need to discuss that with the local communities. They need to work out the protocols with the local communities work out uh, quality control, uh, all that needs to be done, but I don't see a role for the foundation in paying for mapping. Um, and that's, 
you know, you can disagree with that. And there are, I'm sure there are people who disagree with that, but because uh, they told me so. But uh, that's where I come down on, on the foundation and paid mapping. Um, can I ask a question about that? Yeah, um, sure. Who's this? This is Gregory. Uh, oh, I'll go ahead. Um, it talked a bit about you doing mapping as a hobby, and you referred to your talk, which I put a link to in the pad in 2016. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember you talking very passionately about that. Um, and when before you were doing your talk, you talked to me and I had to say, this is a great chat, but you need to go and do your talk in two minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wondered, since 2016, you're, you're obviously retired now and not in um, Turkmenistan, but have you mm -hmm. kept connected to that community and to the mapping? Um, and is there any update to what's happening in OpenStreetMap in Turkmenistan now? Well, I, I am still in connection with people back there. There isn't really a community uh, in Turkmenistan because it's a police state and uh, NGOs are frowned upon and are tightly controlled by the government. So there, there is not really an organized community of, of OSM mappers, but I am in touch with some of the mappers. Um, uh, I do still get some data from them and help them with mapping uh, because of the bandwidth limitations and difficulties that they have uh, uh, in, in just simply getting things on the map sometimes. So uh, I am still mapping. I also, while I was there, I collected a voluminous amount of data that I did not have time to put on the map. I simply collected the raw data and brought it out with me. And so I have been mining that and improving the map using data that I, I collected before departure a year ago. So yeah, that, that effort continues. Uh, at this point, I have identified all cities in Turkmenistan. I have identified all but four towns, and, and these are defined by statute. Turkmenistan has laws that define what is a city, what is a town, what is a village. Uh, we have identified over 500 villages out of roughly 1,700. Uh, we have pretty well completed the national highway network and uh, just continue to, uh, to, to build this out. And what is gratifying to me is seeing how local mappers, when we create a village or a town or a city and draw the streets, they go in and fill in the blanks. They add the businesses. They add their own little bed and breakfast places. They, they add their little hairdressing salons. Um, they're, they're really using the map. It's not just a static map that sits there. They're actually adding detail to it. So that's, uh, that makes me feel good that I can, I can go in and do some of the heavy lifting and actually creating the Christmas tree, and then they come in and decorate it. Cool, great. You almost have me worried uh, that, um, when you kind of stop having any data that took me to stop that stop up, stops being updated. But um, it seems that there well, is some activity. There is a fair amount of activity. Uh, it's not as robust a community, obviously, as uh, the communities in, in other parts of the world. Again, because of bandwidth limitations, the high uh, cost of the internet, and and simply uh, the fact that it's it's a police state, which tends to suppress that sort of community-based organization. Uh, but but there is still some stuff going on, and it's good to see. Uh, someone asked a question, Erica asked a question, does that mean you do not support the microgrants? No, I, I voted for the microgrant program. And in fact, uh, when the microgrant program was first proposed, uh, we gave a limit of 10 microgrants to the microgrant committee and uh, said we would only fund up to 10. Well, they came back with, with a total of 13 that they wanted to fund. We said, fine, we'll do 20% over, and we approved 12 out of 10. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I support the microgrant program. More questions? Go back to the pad, see if there's anything new there.
one person put a comment here that there should have been a photo of the speaker in my presentation. Uh, I dispensed with that because, uh, quite frankly, um, I'm not the most attractive person in the world, so I don't think you need to look at my picture in the presentation. I wanted you to focus on what I was saying anyway. Any more questions? We're coming up on the top of the hour, so we'll be wrapping this up fairly soon. No more questions. Nobody wants to come up on open mic. Nobody else has a question. Gosh. Now somebody's typing. All right, so we've got a couple of people typing. Uh, Rob's asking, what does the next 12 months look like for the board? I think, I think uh, a couple of things that the board is gonna be focusing on is the question of whether we should uh, hire hire some people to maintain the infrastructure. Um, that's a that's something that the board needs to grapple with. We're very concerned about uh, the fact that we're down to two sysadmins, both volunteers, who are in charge of managing over 90 servers uh, spread across uh, multiple sites. Um, there are just we're, we're looking at some infrastructure issues, uh, particularly in the face of 50% year-on-year growth for demand of, of OSM data. Um, what do we need to do to ensure that the platform remains stable, that the platform remains robust, and that the platform is going to be there when people want it to be there, whether that's mappers like me, who are just, we, I want the platform there so that I can map. Uh, other people want the platform there so that they can download the data and can use the data. So I think I think that's that's one of the big issues we're going to be looking at is should we hire people? And if so, uh, how would we go about doing that? What would that look like? How would it be financed? How would it be funded? Is the money out there? Can the money be collected in a way that insulates uh, the foundation from uh, pressure? from the donors and things like that. So these are the questions I think that we're going to be looking at. Um, that's probably the top priority. Uh, the second priority uh, I would say is the continued uh, geographic expansion of, of the community and getting more local chapters and where local chapters are not possible, have local communities with some sort of an affiliate status. So uh, that, that I would say uh, that that's going to be plenty for us to work on over the next next 12 months. Uh, would you like to see a third party Google Maps competitor OSM site? Do you see this being run by OSMF any day or, or get an openstreetmap.org subdomain? Um, Are you talking about a commercial site like Google Maps? Is that what you have in mind? Something that's not free? Yeah, I, I don't see the foundation doing that. Um, you know, there has been one fork of the project, uh, FOSM.org, um, but I, I don't see us going going the route of a, a commercial fork that would compete head on head on with Google. What what are you talking about? You say not really commercial, but what what does that mean? Yeah, I uh
Yeah, I guess I'm out of my depth on on a question like that. It's not something that the board has thought about. It's not something we've we've thought about. It's not something that's under consideration. That said, I mean, uh, projects are eminently forkable. If you want to fork the project and do something, as long as you're in compliance with the license, you can do that. More questions. Now oh, people are typing. Going back to the pad, there. Uh, don't see any questions back there. So we're very close to the top of the hour. If there are no further questions, uh, well, Guy is typing something. Guy and Gregory are both typing something. So we'll wait for their questions, and then I think we'll wrap it up. Really good to consider the long-term strategy. It will evolve, I'm sure. Thanks for the talk. Yeah, well, you're welcome. And and we really uh, we really would like to hear from everybody in the community to, uh, what your thoughts are, how we should evolve. Um, we we can't afford to stagnate. We do need to evolve. We do need to look at the the, the problems that we're facing and, and figure out how to solve them. Gregory is typing something, and I think we'll take that. Whatever Gregory is typing, and then we will wrap up. Type faster, Gregory. Have you had difficulty learning how to communicate with the community? Um, not really. Um, you know, I was a diplomat for uh, 34 years. Um, I lived in multiple continents and uh, I've dealt with people from all walks of life. So um, actually, uh, this is one of the more homogeneous communities because uh, most the vast majority of the people in this community are, are involved in technology. And so uh, people involved in technology uh, tend to have higher than average intelligence. They tend to have higher than average awareness of, of what's going on in the world around them. So actually communicating with, with this community has been uh, a relatively easy thing to do. And, and I've also found that in the vast majority of cases, if I can get a phone number for someone, they're happy to talk to me and happy to tell me what they think. I don't have to try to, to draw them out and, and, coax them into telling me what they think. So, no, this has been a relatively easy communication exercise for me, but uh, a very enjoyable one. And I look forward to the next year of this. So thank you all. Thank you everybody for, uh, I really appreciate this. Uh, the questions were great. Uh, I hope that my answers were, were at least acceptable. Um, and, and if I wasn't able to answer a question, I apologize, but some of your questions touch on things that the board just hasn't thought about. So thank you. And, uh, let's go back to uh, state of the map. Thank you all.